Hello. Welcome. I'm Mark Jones. I'm Master of St. Cross College. Uh, this is the 50th anniversary of St. Cross College. It was founded in 1965. It started with five students. Now it has more than 550 students. It's one of the biggest graduate colleges in the university. Uh, we have students, as you would expect, from all around the world and doing all the disciplines that are taught in Oxford. We thought, therefore, that we would celebrate our 50th anniversary by asking a number of distinguished speakers to come and give a series of St. Cross lectures. And this evening is the first of those St. Cross lectures. So I'm very pleased indeed that our first lecture is being given by one of our honorary fellows, Dr. Susan Weber, who is the Iris Horowitz Professor in the History of Decorative Arts and the founder director of the Bard Graduate Center for Studies in the Decorative Arts, Design and Culture in New York. Susan Weber is a remarkable person. She's made the Bard the world's leading postgraduate center for the study of decorative art and design, while at the same time contributing her wisdom to, among others, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Frick, the Museum of Modern Art, the Brooklyn Museum, and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and at the same time has made the Bard one of the liveliest venues for exhibitions uh, in New York with uh, an astonishingly wide range of topics generated both by the staff of the Bard itself and by collaborators, collaborators uh, across the globe. In April, for example, the two new shows will be one on shaping the silhouette and another on the interface experience, 40 years of personal computing. Meanwhile, Dr. Weber has herself produced a series of enormously interesting and valuable exhibitions and publications on E.W. Godwin, Thomas Jekyll, James and Athenian Stewart, and most recently, William Kent. I know of the last two directly uh, because they were done in collaboration with the Victorian Albert Museum, and both of them focused attention on fascinating and influential but little-known figures in the history of design in Britain, and both have become definitive works in their field. William Kent, in fact, has just won both the Alfred Barr and the Philip Johnson Awards. But Susan Weber's intellectual interests range more widely than even this would suggest, from Castellani and Jörg Jensen to American circus and Swedish wooden toys. This evening, she's going to talk about her current research for an exhibition which is also going to be shown at the v &A and the Bard. John Lockwood Kipling, Exploring Art and Design from Bombay to the Punjab. Thank you. And thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to be the first in this 50th anniversary series of the college. Thank you. Now, the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford seemed like a strange setting for this lecture this evening, but not really, for there once existed an <coughs> Indian Institute in the University of Oxford, founded by Bowdoin Professor of Sanskrit, M. Monier Williams. Its purpose, as reported by British and colonial newspapers, was, quote, to house a complete collection of specimens of the products of India, and a library of Indian literature, and of books relating to India, as well as to be a center of Oriental study and a meeting place for all who were interested in that portion of the empire. It was erected in 1896, and though the institute no longer exists here, there are still many signs of the original use of the building, from its weathercock in the form of an elephant with a howdah, to its carved interior uh, Indian door. As part of the campaign to establish the institute, Williams made a trip to Calcutta in 1883 in order to take advantage of the Calcutta International Exhibition, one of his many trips to India. He also enlisted the help of many Indian officials and authorities in assembling collections of local productions and shipping them to Oxford, including John Lockwood Kipling, curator of the Lahore Museum of Art and principal of its adjoining Mayo School of Art, the subject of today's lecture. So who is this shadowy figure, rather underrecognized, who is known more as the father of the author Rudyard Kipling 
than for his own career devoted to the preservation of traditional Indian arts and crafts. His own book plate that you see in front of you shows in relief a seated profile figure, the right hand uh, sketching on an open volume. He's smoking a briar pipe. The self-portrait is of a bold Socratic head with a fully bearded face. The same characteristics reappear in the portrait that was painted upon his retirement in Lahore and presented <laughs> at the Mayo School of Art which is today, as you know, the National College of Arts, Lahore. Uh, he stood, in fact, only about five foot three. The kindly manner, indeed an air of benevolence, exactly corresponds with most accounts of him. He was a ceramicist and conservationist, journalist, illustrator, curator, and teacher. Kipling spent most of his working career in British India. John Lockwood Kipling, 1837, to 1911, exploring Asian art and design from Bombay to the Punjab will open at the V&A in the winter of 2016 and then travel to the Bard Graduate Center in 2017. I am co-curator of this project and co-editor of the accompanying catalog, along with Julius Bryant, keeper of word and image at the V&A. Today's lecture is a preview of the newest collaborative subject between both these two institutions. So John Lockwood Kipling <coughs> was born in Pickering, North Yorkshire, to the Reverend Joseph Kipling and Francis Lockwood Kipling, and educated at Woodhouse Grove School, a Methodist boarding school. He received a sound education in Latin, French, mathematics, and sculpture. Kipling's first exposure to Indian artifacts was his visit to the 1851 great exhibition in London when he was 14 years old. This trip convinced him to become an artist and craftsman. Kipling's initial experience overlapped or intersected with what would come to be known as the show that spawned the birth of the international exhibition movement. Kipling could only dream at 14 that he would spend a lifetime participating in so many of the subsequent exhibitions. The Indian court, which occupied a central section in Paxton's monumental glass and metal exhibition hall, was organized by the East India Company. A great range of luxury objects, from an ivory throne to elaborate embroidered textiles, were displayed. This was the first time that such a vast array of things from the subcontinent had been collected and arranged into a major show in Europe. The great exhibition presented a new view of Indian arts and crafts to many whose only contact before would have been through written records or small collections. The Times of London highlighted the Indian section as being, to quote, one of the most complete, splendid, and interesting collections in Hyde Park, instructive in a great variety of ways, and the merit of which cannot be too highly praised, end of quote. It was the catalyst by which Indian decorative arts became the focus of European attention. European observers identified key skills, specifically a sophisticated use of color and ornament. These craft skills could then be applied to items of British manufacture. Many items were acquired from this and later exhibitions for the South Kensington Museum as models of design and taste for the study of the British craftsmen. Kipling left school at 14, and shortly after, he went to work as a designer and modeler at the pottery firm of Pinder, Bourne and Company in Burslem, Staffordshire, a medium-sized firm, mainly manufacturing quite ordinary tableware and souvenir plates, examples of which you see in front of you. The son of the company director remembered Kipling as, quote, a very clever young man, though somewhat eccentric. He used, I remember, as a boy to carry pet mice attached to him by fine chains. He was a very vigorous man full of amusing stories and could do innumerable tricks. He was at the firm for roughly seven years until about 1858, at the same time attending evening courses at the Pottery School of Art, Stoke-on-Trent, a government training school. His teachers included two French sculptors, 
Carrier Belus and Yu Protel, who were employed as modelers at Minton's factory. Their breadth of experience, versatility, and ambition helped to explain Kipling's awareness of the design world beyond Burslem. In 1854, he won a local medal for success in art awarded by the Department of Science and Art, South Kensington, while at the Pottery School of Art, and in 1858, he won a national medallion awarded by the same Department of Science and Art. These schools had originally been set up under the Department of Science and Art, and in 1857 were taken under the wing of the South Kensington Museum. Their remit was the supplying of art teachers to all places which seek to establish art schools. It was probably through this connection that Lockwood spent two years in London as an apprentice to J. Bernie Phillip, a successful sculptor who worked on the frieze on the podium of the Albert Memorial and with Gilbert Scott on some of the modeling for Exeter College Chapel, Oxford, and All Souls, Halifax. In 1861, he was employed as a sculptor, modeler, and decorator at the South Kensington Museum in London. He worked on the architectural decoration of the building, especially the terracotta decoration. He liaised between the museum and the manufacturers in the Burslem potteries. He wrote a report for the museum on glazed terracotta, on glazed terracotta that has since gone missing. His contribution must have been appreciated because in Sykes celebrated terracotta plaque in the quadrangle of the museum may be seen not only Henry Cole and other leading lights connected with the construction, but among the lesser lights, quite unmistakably, John Kipling, Beard and all. The subject is part of a triumphal procession to mark the completion of the building. There is a preliminary <coughs> sketch in the museum print room by John Sykes, who died before the design was executed. And the final version, if you compare the two, differs from the sketch in having three additional figures. In 1863, Kipling was awarded with Robert Edgar, first prize in a competition to design the facade and elevation of the Wedgwood Memorial Institute Burslem to be made in ceramic ware used as structural features of the facade rather than pure decoration. The building was to demonstrate the qualities of ceramics and act as promotion of the material. The drawings for the bright red brickwork with its buff-colored terracotta ornament were exhibited in the architectural exhibition at Conduit Street, London, the following year. The designs for the upper story included the series of panels representing the months with deep reliefs of male and female classically draped figures with molded frames, the zodiac mosaics, and the panels between the two stories depicting 10 relief terracotta panels of the processes involved in pottery, pottery manufacture. Now, let me find it. A pearlware jug decorated by, uh, where is it? <coughs> I've lost it. Oh, there it is. A pearlware jug decorated by Kipling with the figure of Bacchus, god of wine, and a male accompanist for his future brother-in-law, Frederick MacDonald, made in 1863, is the only identifiable product of his pottery work at this time. In 1863, he met Alice MacDonald, the charming, vivacious woman to whom he would become engaged to. And in front of you is their engagement photo. The two were married in March of 1865, and he would become connected to a family deeply integrated into the 19th century artist world of Great Britain. Her sisters had married the artists Edward Burne Jones and Edward Pointer. Shortly after, Kipling and Alice would leave for India, where he took up the post of architectural sculptor at the JJ School in Bombay. Once in Bombay, Kipling set up an atelier on the school grounds. There was no school building instructed yet. Bombay was a city in flux when he arrived. The fort walls were being removed, the economic, spatial planning, and architectural vision for the entire city were just being organized. This was driven by the vision of Sir Henry Bartle Frere, 
the governor of Bombay, and partly financed by a cotton boom of exceptional proportions triggered by the American Civil War. Frere wanted Bombay to be built in the Gothic style, and many foreign architects were invited to compete and propose buildings for the new city. Among them were Owen Jones, Gigi Scott, and William Burgess. At the school, Kipling would train native craftsmen how to sculpt and work in terracotta and other ceramic productions. After a century of British influence and imports to South Asia, craft traditions had suffered in India. Rather than imposing European art school training, Kipling encouraged his students to explore their own heritage and local skills, thus promoting the revival of local historic crafts and design. In Kipling's opinion, to quote, Indian art schools were vehicles of a kind of cultural imperialism in which misplaced models of Western art were imposed on Indian students to the detriment of any training whatsoever in native techniques. His innovation was to cultivate as strenuously as possible those ideas and methods of design which are peculiarly national and characteristic. He grounded the school's pedagogy in a, the indigenous traditional crafts of the province, combined with instruction in aesthetic theory and training in technical and freehand drawing. Students in every course were required to apply their drawing skill to local building ornaments and forms and to prepare original designs for traditional crafts. This represented a significant departure from the style of training available in most other technical schools, which paid scant attention to Indian objects, art traditions, canonical texts, or methods. With the help of his students, Kipling was responsible for the elaborate sculptural work on many of the public buildings being done in Bombay in the Bombay Gothic style. They were carried out in marble, stone, and plaster. And you see in front of you uh, Kipling's students in his studio uh, working on the actual Crawford panel market. And the students were remunerated around the province under his supervision. Uh, Crawford, and I just show you uh, what the, um, the JJ School of Art, often called the Bombay School of Art, would look like when it was finally constructed after Kipling had departed. Now, Crawford Market, which opened in 1871, uh, were some of the first um, commissions that Kipling worked on with his students. Three of the seven arched openings had typonins, each with a sculptural relief by Kipling and his students. The plaque to the right of the central en entrance depicts um, agriculture and the processes involved in the growing and selling of vegetables. These, in a way, are similar to the ceramic um, production, the scenes he did for the Wedgwood Institute. Kipling also created a series of plaques on the lower level of the fountain at the market. They depict four Indian river goddesses interspersed with native birds of India. In 1867, he sculpted a, um, a bust of um, David Sassoon for the Sassoon Mechanics Institute, Bombay. Other decorative designs for buildings included the University of Bombay, the Courts of Justice, the Secretariat, and the Victoria Terminus. It is not surprising that in 1873, Colonel H. St. Clair Williams, the architect of the new Secretariat in Bombay, wrote to Kipling, quote, I consider you that you were the pioneer of your art in this country. In 1863, an architectural design of mine was said to be out of the question owing to the introduction of foliated capitals and carving. In 1865, you had, I believed, performed that which in 1863 had been pronounced impossible, end of quote. While all this was happening, he also visited in 1870 Upper India and prepared sketches of the craftsmen at work in the northwestern provinces. Um, this commission came from the government of India and was part of the wider cultural surveys of India 
post-1857 war for economic and anthropological reasons. They were meant to accompany the actual specimens by these craftsmen for display at the London International Exhibition of 1871. He also prepared drawings of the looms, tools, and accessories used and made careful descriptive notes of the processes of manufacture. Clay models of the workmen immersed in their craft were also part of the display. Some of these models are preserved in the collection of the Edinburgh Museum. Images and models of native craftsmen become standard fare at exhibitions, part of museum collections, and illustrated in books and journals in the second half of the 19th century. At later exhibitions, actual craftsmen were on display, producing articles for sale in fabricated settings. 56 of Kipling's sketches were exhibited in the large central court, which was reserved for the collections organized by the government of India at the International Exhibition of 1871. All 56 of these drawings were acquired by the Indian Museum and then transferred to the South Kensington Museum in 1880, later renamed, as you know, the Victoria and Albert Museum. The majority of these drawings are in pencil and ink on paper. They are mounted on stiff cardboard and many have written annotations affixed to them, explaining in detail the craft de depicted and further described by Kipling. Uh, in front of you, you see uh, a silk weaver in Amherstar <laughs> in 1870, and I also have paired up with these um, Kipling um, drawings um, actual specimens that the V&A Museum had acquired at about the same time. In the, this next one, we see a craftsman preparing stone for marble inlay work, and you see a box and cover paired with it, uh, the sort of work that um, such a craftsman would be uh, working on. Here we see a pattern draftsman uh, and the sort of um, shawl, pashmina shawl, with a, a bota um, uh, motif that was quite common at the time. Uh, a seat craftsman is seated on the floor here holding the comb between his feet as he saws the individual teeth. Uh, you see to the left of him a, a pile of completed combs and uh, his working tools are placed around him. And uh, in this um, example, which is prisoners from Amherstair Gold with weaving duries, Kipling has annotated the drawing with the following. The weaving of a dari or tapestry woven rug in which the warp is entirely hidden by the weft. The weavers are convex in Amherstar gold. <coughs> Yet another shows a woman painting earthenware toys, and these were all placed in a, a stand near the first case of woven fabrics. And if you look carefully, you can see these rotating stands. They um, had uh, multiple frames, and they were designed by Henry Cole, for display at the South Kensington Museum. And uh, we, in fact, we've located one of these stands uh, in the basement of the Natural History Museum and hope to uh, get it out for the exhibition. Now, for the cotton division of the uh, London 1872 exhibition, the international ex exhibition of the following year in London, Kipling was employed again by the government of India, but this time, to draw a series of sketches of cotton cultivation in Western India and of the leading members of the village system in the cotton districts. They were part of a special exhibition of Indian cotton in which specimens of everything connected with the trade and cultivation of cotton were organized and shown. These drawings ranged from the tools for cotton cultivation, plows, seeds, drills, hoes, etc., to the different members of the village that carried out everything from blacksmithing to carpentry. Now, Kipling's work in preserving um, Indian art traditions reflects the sensibilities of a practicing craftsman. He studied the techniques and technologies that produced both the object and the Indian social structure of hereditary craftsmanship. 
On the basis of his success in Bombay, in 1875, Kipling was appointed to, the, to be principal. Oh, and I just want to show you that um, these are pictures of um, traditional craftspeople in Pakistan today, and that Lahore uh, today has uh, 100 traditional crafts uh, that are still being done in traditional ways and still very much part of life there. So on the basis of his success in Bombay, in 1875, Kipling was appointed the principal of the Mayor School of Art Lahore, present-day National College of Art Pakistan, founded in memory of the sixth Earl of Mayo after his assassination in 1872. In the report of public instruction in the Punjab for the year 1884, the chief administrator noted, quote, the object of the school is twofold. To train craftsmen in the higher and more artistic branches of their crafts, and especially in the principles of design, and to exercise a general influence over the artistic industries of the province by acting as an aesthetic center, a school of design, and the source of enlightened criticism and advice, and to command a remunerative market for the labor. The Mayo School was centrally administrated from the South Kensington Museum in London, whose curriculum and textbooks were also adopted. Kipling continued his campaign to revive Indian crafts with instruction focused on indigenous models of design. Both students and the faculty at the school participated as part of the normal work of the school, including manufacturing and installing wall coverings, frescoes, furniture for use in churches, museums, and private houses, and undertaking various decorative work on the government college, the Punjab club, and chief court, and other buildings in the city. In addition, students prepared maps, plans, and illustrations for the Civil and Military Gazette and other publications, sold their artwork at colonial exhibitions, supplied reproductions of furniture and other crafts to the South Kensington Museum. Kipling was also appointed chief curator of the old original Lahore Museum, which figured as the Wonder House in his son's camp. Kipling proceeded on the same lines as at Bombay, with a few pupils in a shabby one-story house of large rooms, training and working until he was able to muster, some 18 years later, a flourishing school in splendid buildings of his own design. During his tenure as the principal of the Mayo School of Art, he patronized indigenous artisans and through training and apprenticeship transformed them into craftsmen and designers. Kipling stressed the necessity of the proximity of the school and museum as to quote him, a comprehensive object book of reference for students to rectify the coarseness and crudity of much modern work, which shows only too plainly how salutary a study of the best old examples would be to modern craftsmen. Lockwood also became interested in monumental Indian art, such as the famous rock temples of Ellora, where he made casts of the sculptors. He made, with his students, plaster casts of the collection of Buddhist sculptures in the Lahore Museum and made a detailed list of their attributes. Some of these were sent to the South Kensington Museum and the colossal head of the Buddha that you see in front of you still survives, but is in storage at the V&A. He also um, made collections both of artifacts, both for the Lahore Museum, and he made his own modest collections, such as uh, this um, collection of native lithograph pictures that was sold at the local bazaars and fairs of Upper India and Bengal. And in fact, his son uh, donated these, which the donated this collection of printings, of prints, paintings, and ink drawings. Uh, uh, and they, these were donated to the V&A in 1917. And these, these images are from his collection. Now, in 1876, Kipling was commissioned by the government of India to design the decorations for the Imperial Assemblage at Delhi in 1877, organized by the Viceroy of India, Lord Lytton, at which Queen Victoria was proclaimed Empress of India. 
This was a political instrument designed to reinforce the loyalty of the remaining princes. Kipling designed the banners and the banner poles for the 63 ruling chiefs and princes and for seven officials, including the viceroy. On one side were to be embroidered titles and on the other side coats of arms. The problem the viceroy faced was that in 1876, India possessed no college of heralds and hence no recognized armorial bearings. It was a need for a solution to the problem which led the viceroy to seek the help of the curator of the Lahore Museum. The theme of the 1877 Durbar was medievalism. Decorations, official music, and many other details alluded to the Middle Ages, or more accurately, to notions about the Middle Ages derived from England's medieval record or revival. Two of these banners still survive, one at Nebworth with its supporting angels and another at the fort at Jodhpur. When complete, the banners were to be swung from brass poles with golden cords and tassels. Unfortunately, through some error in design, the poles proved to be so heavy that each banner required two brawny highlanders to carry it. And when born in procession, the banner had to be carried on an elephant. <laughs> the school also provided full-size drawings for embroideries used to decorate the vice regal dais at the assemblage. Let me go back. So, Kipling also gave suggestions and drawings for the amphitheater made for the imperial assemblage, of which a piece survives at Nebworth. The semicircular seating arrangement was based on guests' social positions in the hierarchy. When artist Val Princep, commissioned by the government to paint the assemblage, saw these structures, he was shocked and said to quote him that they outdid the Crystal Palace in hideosity. <laughs> Kipling received 500 rupees and a silver medal for his designs. Although the amount was quite inadequate, he gained considerable prestige through this commission. Kipling worked on or participated in almost 25 exhibitions from Australia to the United States from 1865 until 1900, with activities ranging from organizer, curator, and artist to exhibitor, designer, and commissioner. He also contributed as an author and reporter in the print culture produced to document and advertise these exhibitions. Uh, he, um, presented students' work at local exhibitions, Nagpur, 1865, Pune, 1866, uh, Calcutta School of Art, 1873, but he also presented students' work at the international exhibitions at London, as we saw, 1871 and 1872, Vienna, 1873, <coughs> and uh, at the... Um, Paris exhibition of 1878, of which you see an illustration before you. Kipling traveled to Paris with his 12-year-old son, Roger, to oversee the installation of the Indian court, organized by George Birdward, keeper of the Indian Museum at South Kensington. As the items arrived in Paris, Kipling described the installation as done with almost painful economy and principally notable for the not absolutely representative collection of objects offered to the Prince of Wales. He criticized the Indian courts as making, to quote him, but as a poor figure in comparison, nor is what we show arranged with any approach to the method, lucidity, and instructiveness, which seems natural to the Frenchman. Kipling organized works from India that were chiefly architectural and character, and comprised a copy of an old tomb, tiles with floriated ornament in two shades of blue for uh, diapers, blue and white earthenware from the Bombay School of Art, and amazingly, uh, these were all bought by the Sev Museum for its study collection and survive there today. Now, Kipling participated in the Melbourne International Exhibition of 1880, its purpose was to establish closer trade relations between India and Australia, and Kipling traveled to Australia to assist in the installation of the Indian court. He organized collections we know of lace, net, embroidery, trimmings, and silk embroidery, as well as a general collection of arts and crafts from the Punjab. 
the students at the Mayo School of Art and Crafts, um, the, the students were from the carpentry division and they worked on a show cabinet fashioned from deodar wood and silver that you can see hiding in the background. The cabinet fitted with glass panels is visible, as I said, in the photograph, in the center of this photograph of the Great Hall. It's filled with shawls, lace, and embroidery, and it won a first order of merit in furniture and accessories. In 1880, Kipling proposed to the Lieutenant Governor of the Punjab that an exhibition of some of the arts and manufacturers of the Punjab at Lahore be held during the last week of 1881. It was made clear in the exhibition memorandum that the exhibition, quote, is intended for the promotion of industrial arts in the Punjab and no articles from outside the Punjab and its dependencies will be admitted into the exhibition. End of quote. Kipling was made honorary secretary of the Central Committee. According to a letter from Alice Kipling, preparations for the Punjab exhibition of 1881-2 consumed both Kipling's body and soul for 18 months. There was, to quote Alice, a whirlwind of activity, much doubting, and some sleepless nights as the show grew to enormous proportions. Kipling not only enlisted the assistance of the school students and staff, but as we now learn, even drafted his wife to arrange the textile exhibits. Display cases and tables were created as well as borrowed from the storerooms of the Lahore Museum and from neighboring institutions. Decoration was minimal. A selection of large-scale carpets, dairies, belts, and embroideries were hung above the cases and tables, situated in the center of the long galleries and the furniture court and against the walls of the School of Art. They provided the major decoration for the fair. The Punjab Education Department commended the local impact of the exhibition. To quote, the Punjab exhibition, though an interruption to regular schoolwork, was extremely useful in showing more clearly than that would be possible in any other way the influence that the school has exercised. The exhibition broadened the visibility of the school's achievement and expanded the accessibility of Indian art traditions to the larger native and Anglo-Indian public. The most surprising items were a set of 13 dessert plates entitled Our Intimate Enemies, created by Kipling himself. Ten of these circular plates are today at Wimpole, Cambridgeshire, the former house of Kipling's granddaughter, Elsie Bambridge. They are blue and white ink drawings for this series of plates in the rare book collection I've just discovered at Princeton. And on the back of one of these plates is an annotated list of 21 titles for these plates. The actual plates are of white earthenware with cobalt blue drawings illustrating Indian servants and craftsmen created by Kipling with sayings derived from British literary notables including Keats, Milton, Shakespeare, and the Bible. The underlying messages, such as native servants are clumsy or like to drink on duty, are typical of the patronizing perspective of the ruling English class in power under the Raj. They are signed JLK and marked J.L. Kipling, 1879, on their reverse. Kipling was also involved in the written culture of the exhibition. He wrote special reports on certain sections of the show, as well as the general um, report of results. Kipling was a member of the general committee and secretary and officer in charge of the Punjab court for the Calcutta exhibition, India's first international show in the Indian Museum and its surrounding grounds that took place in 1883 to 1884. It was the largest and most comprehensive and popular Indian exhibition of its day. The Punjab's work curated by Kipling filled two courts, and the, on the right side were the items in wood. The locations of the various towns from which the examples originated from were identified by, quote, bold, handsomely made letters by the pupils of the School of Art and executed in a masterly freehand style. The school's major artistic contribution to the exhibition was a 140-foot ornamental frieze painted by the senior art students in tempera on brown paper. According to Kipling, all of the panels were distinctive, and no two panels of which were alike. 
This had precisely the effect anticipated of framing in the court with a characteristic and significant band of colored ornament. The court was diversified by terracotta busts of workers and some specimens of the richly fretted and gilded ceiling work once common in the Punjab. The two, if you look carefully, you can see some of these busts, and two of them were by Kipling, and we know to survive today in the Lahore Museum of Art. The court was a fully designed, as you see, total exhibition environment, creating an Orientalist spectacle. It persuaded visitors to imagine themselves in a timeless India, dependent on fantasy and traditional practice. It was a conflation, according to Hoffenberg, of Indian bazaar, tent, and princely interior. In addition, Kipling wrote the Punjab section of the official catalog of the Calcutta exhibition and co-authored with Baden Powell the descriptive catalog of Punjab contributions to the Calcutta International Exhibition. And this is some of the um, carpentry work that uh, the school did, and Kipling considered that carpentry was the finest division of, or output of the school at the time. For the Jaipur exhibition in 1883, which coincided with the Calcutta exhibition, Kipling acted as one of the committee of jurors for the textile and art manufacturers section of the show. The exhibition under the patronage of Maharaja Singh II displayed works from its school of art established in 1866, specimens from local manufacturers and comparable arts and crafts from surrounding parts of India in the new palace administrative building. It was commemorated in a lavish four volume catalog, Memorials of the Jaipur Exhibition, which documented the 10,000 objects of the show. Kipling wrote the report on the arms and armor. He remarked that, quote, it was doubtful whether a more choice or interesting collection of arms had ever been assembled than that shown at the Jaipur exhibition. For the 1886 colonial, Indian colonial exhibition held at South Kensington, Kipling was appointed head of the Punjab Committee for the collection and exhibition of artware and fabrics. The exhibit opened on the 4th of May, 1886, and lasted over six months. Designed by Purden Clark and assigned almost one-third of the entire exhibition space, the Indian section was not only the largest, but one of the most magnificent of the displays. Its numerous pavilions, courtyards, and gardens occupied five times the amount of space as the Indian sections of the Crystal Palace in Hyde Park in 1851. It included an Indian palace with an extravagant Durbar Hall that you see in front of you, which were carved by two Punjabi craftsmen. Kipling was commissioned to design a carved screen of Punjabi work as a framework to the Punjabi court. To meet this commission, Kipling designed, according to him, arcades of carved wood, 100 feet of tunnel, he described it, to be hung with Indian pukharis and other gay cloths. The Glasgow Museum bought 14 pieces from the Punjab section of the show. These included four panels of wooden ornamental work inlaid with brass scroll foliage and borders of brass and three shields. The South Kensington Museum bought two glazed earthenware jars, one brown, the other blue, nine drawings copied from inlaid marble flooring and wall paneling of the royal baths in the palace of the Punjab and a carved wood window from Amherster. In 1887, Kipling and the Mayo School was entrusted with the expenditure of 5,000 5, rupees on a collection of objects of Punjab production for the upcoming Glasgow exhibition of 1888. In addition to procuring these objects, Kipling wrote on these and other Punjabi specimens for the exhibition catalog. The arts and crafts were displayed in a bizarre-like display. The court contained a large door and windows, and day or door wood, and two smaller windows in either corner of the court, executed by Punjabi natives demonstrating their trades at the fair. <coughs> these wooden specimens were purchased for Glasgow's museums. The Glasgow Museums also bought an additional 36 items from the Punjab collection selected by Kipling, including large lacquerware 
box and the enameled silver bracelets that you see ahead of you. The scout for the South Kensington Museum did not find the work exhibited for the most part admirable and writes that, quote, the Indian exhibition is large but contains little or nothing that we do not already possess and of inferior quality to works produced 20 or 30 years ago. In 1893, Kipling visited the World Columbian Exposition in Chicago. He may have attended as an acting representative for the British government, since they did not send an official representative, or perhaps he was part of the team that worked on the Lockwood de Forest Commission to design and erect a complete Indian room in carved teakwood. There was a separate East India Pavilion that was not erected by the government as in previous fairs, but now private enterprise. The exterior of the building that you see in front of you was an East India style modeled remotely after the fashion of the Taj Mahal. The building was one story high with a gallery and consisted of one open room set up as a bazaar with a central skylight. In 1898, Queen Victoria appointed Kipling as one of the commissioners for the Paris Universal Exhibition of 1900. Kipling had finally made it to the rank of official for an exhibition. This would be the last show Kipling would participate in. Now, I'm just going to whiz through. Uh, he's, he uh, also did some royal commissions. Who you see in front of you is the Duke of Connaught and Princess Louise, and Kipling designed an Indian billiard room for their Tudor Gothic style house built to the designs of Benjamin Ferry. As you know, the Duke was an officer in the British Army, and he was transferred to the Indian Army in 1883, and the Connaughts took an active role in the promotion of Indian culture, and a meeting, at a meeting between the Connaughts and Kipling at the Calcutta Exhibition, which you know was held during the winter of 1884, an idea for decorating a billiard room at Bagshot um, Park in Indian style emerged, and uh, finding that the Indian princes wished to give the Connaughts a belated wedding gift, it was suggested that they should sponsor the construction of the new room. And so all matters of cost were therefore put aside. And if there was ever a temptation to indulge in an Indian extravaganza, it was resisted here in favor of a room which would bear witness to royal patronage of India's crafts, especially the Punjabi woodcarvers. And uh, this is what the um, room looked like in the early 20th century. Uh, there were, uh, I think, 241 panels altogether, each one differently decorated. The, the, uh, <coughs> the room uh, exists today. Um, and you can see all of the myriad details of the room. And even uh, there are all sorts of animals and um, flora and fauna uh, rich imagery from natural history carved into the room. There were chairs, which amazingly have just come onto the market, and the Victorian Albert has just purchased one of these heavily carved chairs for the upcoming um, Kipling show. Kipling also designed, but in London, these were made, um, a, a billiards table and a billiards scoreboard in this sort of um, Indian style. Uh, these, in fact, were formerly in the collection of John Lennon, and we've just now uh, traced them to yet a, another private collection. And then the Queen saw the, um, the finished room in 1890 and wanted one of her own. And um, she was determined to have one of these Indian rooms at her own house at Osborne, her Italianate house on the Isle of Wight. But unlike the Bagshot room, which was paid by the generosity of Indian princes, the cost of the Osborne room decoration was to be borne by the queen herself. So the compromises that were resulted as a means of keeping the costs down meant that there would be little use of real wood carvings from the Punjab. In their place, they were to be plaster enrichments. And it is clear, therefore, that the queen's room, unlike the duke's room, was no monument to Indian craft traditions. Even though Ram Singh, the, an associate of Kipling's was brought over from the Mayo School to carve and supervise the models for the plaster enrichments. Uh, Mr. George Jackson of Rathbone Place, London, undertook the commission, and the enrichments for the ceiling were made in 
fibrous um, plaster. The pagodas on the side walls were made partly of wood and uh, partly of carton pierre, a type of papier mache common in the late 19th century. Um, and uh, the queen loved the room and uh, she often ma she made it her banqueting room and she received dignitaries and displayed her Christmas gifts there during the final decades of her life. In 1887, Kipling was finally made a companion of the Indian Empire <coughs> for his services in the study of Indian art. And his last annual report for the Mayo School in, 19, in 1893 described student work on the internal decorations for the new buildings for the Lahore Museum, recalling his own earliest work on the South Kensington Museum, where he decorated the new facades. Throughout the 1880s, under Kipling's leadership, the Lahore Museum successfully combined reinstatement of indigenous models of design and production with the government's drive to align museums with the encouragement of industrial arts to help local craftsmen to produce goods that could compete in local and global markets. This was formalized through the government administration's resolution 239 to use Indian museums specifically to promote trade and to direct the future of Indian craft through the development and alignment of their collections with art schools and technical college training. Resolution 239 also promoted the development of art publications. Uh, the Journal of Indian Art was uh, initiated. It ran for 17 volumes starting in 1884 and was finally closed down in 1917, six years after Kipling's death. He was its uh, initial editor. Uh, many of his essays focused on a particular regional where, emphasizing the apparently long and unique history of the locale, its artisanal, religious, and ethnic traditions and materials. Um, he wrote on such subjects from the brass and copperware of the Punjab and Kashmir to uh, Indian architecture of today. Um, he designed the frontispiece that I just showed you and his students at the Mayo School of Art often contribute illustrations for the journal, and Kipling also encouraged the latest photographic and reproductive innovations to ensure accurate, attractive, and enduring illustrations of traditional art. And Griggs and his staff who published the journal took advantage of that encouragement and of the most current technology to produce exquisite color chromo and photolithographs, an example of which you see in front of you. Now, as for Lockwood Kipling's own writings, he was a constant contributor to the local Indian press, working for the Pioneer and the Civil and Military <laughs> Gazette. He needed the money, and writing came naturally to him. He remained anonymous in his newspaper articles. He used pseudonyms such as our Bombay correspondent and nicotine Nick. <laughs> it was uh, his regret when he was in Lahore that the British took so little interest in the ancient city and its history, and he collaborated, we know, with Thomas Henry Thornton in a small booklet or guidebook published at Lahore as uh, called Lahore As It Is and Was. With Flora um, Annie Steele, he illustrated tales of the Punjab told by the people, a collection of folk tales from the Punjab in, um, and these are some of his illustrations, with Frederica MacDonald, who published the Iliad of the East in 1908. Kipling provided seven illustrations. Uh, his scenes are all typically Indian and depict legends from the Sanskrit poem, the Ramayana, and reveal really the illustrator's knowledge of the subject. His major book was Beast and Man, and uh, he did, for this book, both word and image, and it deals mainly with the domesticated or semi-domesticated animals of India for those who have never seen them. And Kipling described this work as, quote, an elementary study of Indian animals, their treatment and usage, and the popular estimate concerning them opens a side door to Indian life, thought, and character, the threshold which is still unworn. And here's another, you can see his humor, very humorous. Um, 
Kipling um, produced a great number of drawings and designs in his later years. His works range from uh, book illustrations, the design of a houseboat, drawings for medals, um, interior designs for Sybil Koufax for her uh, home at 85 Onslow Square, London, and he even designed a clock turret at All Saints Wilden, erected in memory of Alfred Balden. Um, he retired in 1893 to the Gables in Tisbury, Wiltshire. He built himself a studio in the garden, and it's here that he uh, worked with his son, Richard, on many of Kip Richard's books. Kip uh, Richard remained close to his father right up to his death in 1911, and the most noteworthy examples of his father's artistic <laughs> talent are really preserved in the various illustrations and covers to some of Rudyard's books. He provided the decorative lithograph designs for the six booklets of tales in Wheeler's Indian Railway Library that you see in front of you. And then he came up with um, this innovation in making these terracotta or plastic plaques um, and then photographing them um, as part of um, illustration for his son's books. You see one uh, of for Mowgli and the, uh, the Wolves for the Jungle Book, and these are some of the sketches for the Jungle Book that uh, the senior Kipling did for his son. And, uh, of course, some of the most famous are these um, terracotta plaques, which were intended as illustrations for Rudyard Kipling's Kim, uh, he did this uh, medallion in red clay of an elephant's head with lotus branch and swastika used on the cover of Kipling's collected editions, although Rudyard had the swastika removed from the emblem in 1933 in silent protest. The, um, it's today at the Baidiki Library. It was just bought at a sale. Um, he continued to do illustrations um, for his grandchildren. This is a um, Kipling ABC um, drawn by him for his grandson, John Kipling, who you know was killed in the Battle of Luce while um, serving with the British Army during World War I. And he worked in color a lot at the end of his life. Kipling died in 1911 and is buried in the parish of Tisbury, Wiltshire. J. H. Rivet Karnak in his many memories observed that Kipling's knowledge of all things Indian, to quote, was superior to that of many senior officials, and that he could see persons and events from the humorous side, and he was the most excellent company. It is not surprising that Gandhi was indebted to Kipling and the wider revival of Indian arts and crafts. Gandhi insisted, you know, that all patriotic Indians reject not only foreign cloth, but also Indian-made mill cloth. He envisioned a nation dressed entirely in handsman, hand-woven cloth, and it is impossible in so brief a time to do justice to Kipling's contributions to the artistic and cultural life of India. And in view of his multifarious achievements through this brief lecture, I hope that I have given you some idea of his own artistic talent and of his deep and abiding love for the Indian subcontinent. So thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, crikey. Uh, I, I'm Zara Sturgis. I'm the director here at the Ashwellian. And uh, first, I'd just like to say how pleased we are at the Ashmolean to be uh, uh, playing host to the St Cross uh, celebrations, but how doubly pleased I am that the first of these celebratory lectures should uh, be from such a champion of uh, museums and of the study of objects uh, that is so much part of what the Ashmolean is about. Um, that was an extraordinary uh, lecture. Uh, there are there are two kinds of extraordinary lectures. One uh, uh, one is those that sort of delve deep into well known territory, and the others are such as one we've just heard, which open up side doors with unworn thresholds and show us the extraordinary riches uh, through them. And um, 
I can't tell you how excited I am at the prospect of the exhibition, and I'm sure we shall be wearing that threshold away fairly uh, shortly. But anyway, uh, Dr. Webb has very kindly offered to um, answer some questions. So if there were any, fire away. Yes, please. Well, thank you very much for that lovely lecture. Um, you started your story in 1851 with Kipling being inspired by the Indian exhibition of the Great, of the Great Exhibition. Do we know anything about, or do you know anything about Pickering and his parents and what might have inspired him before that? Or is that really the origin, do you think, of this extraordinary creation? Well, we, we know that his father was a Wesleyan minister. And... Um, that the family moved every two to three years, as was the, the nature of being a minister in, in that uh, division. Um, and we know um, very little about him. He leaves no diary, there are no family letters. As you know, his son, Roger, um, was adverse to people knowing about the family's private life. And on the father's death, there was a great burning of private letters and um, even of some um, scraps, uh, scraps of articles that Kipling himself had, the father had written in the local um, Indian journals and it was like um, they were retelling or reinventing his, his um, public known life. So um, we're, not, we're not quite sure where he got this incredible facility. I mean, the, the man is always doodling. I mean, if you go to, I, to the, if you're really interested, I would go to the University of Sussex, which the National Trust has donated all of his uh, surviving scrapbooks and sketchbooks and galleys. And um, you, can, you cannot, his fingers were always doing something and the humor and um, <coughs> the, um, the, the glow that you feel through these sketches are just extraordinary. But what's difficult to come to terms with, such as I showed you those plates with their sort of very um, haughty, um, anti-native feeling, is how to see Kipling. Because he's, you know, he's a, a promoter of the Indian craftsman, but yet he's, a, he's working for the Indian government and uh, he has some uh, rather um, typical British views for, for, you know, of the time. So it's important, I find, to sort of understand how he fit in and yet how he was different. Yes, please. Hi, I was wondering about um, when you talked about the designs of the coat of arms for the princess. Um, what exactly, what, what, can you show off a bit of a further light on that? Because I'm very intrigued by the fact that there was no sort of, you know, symbolic or added tradition in India before. And then these guys invented sort of out of the blue. And was he having any discussions with uh, what should go, what motives should go? Because some of those motives are very, very traditional and so they're rooted in the same, for example, the totemic origins of the princes. Uh, so some things like so objects that they were worshipping as their totems or symbolisms that, and they have incorporated that in sort of a very Western vocabulary. Well, um, and also having Sanskrit mottos mm -hmm, and things like mm -hmm. that. So was he involved in sourcing this information from somewhere, and if so, where? Well, that commission that I showed you was done with uh, Ram Singh, who was trained at the Mayo School and had his own brilliant career after Kipling left. And uh, it's always hard to know. There are letters, there are Kipling letters. There are also amazing Kipling letters with the Connaughts, who were really interested in uh, Indian decorative arts and their promotion, and in fact had their own collections of Indian artifacts, particularly brasswares and ceramics that Kipling advised on and that they brought home here. And um, Kipling really was incredibly knowledgeable about India and really um, was an India hand. And um, in fact, what's sort of interesting is one discovers when you research Kipling that he was in um, constant friction with Birdwood, 
who was the curator at the South Kensington Museum, who had very different views of um, Indian arts and crafts and the traditions. And um, you can, um, the Connaughts, I think, were a very unusual couple to be in India. Um, and uh, they did a lot for the craft traditions there and a lot for the Mayo School in Lahore. And I, I think um, also what you see is the work as well of, as, of Ram Singh. Well, thank you. You've been an extraordinary audience. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weber. And I'm happy to say that thanks to St. Cross, we are now all invited to uh, head to the Randolph Sculpture Gallery upstairs for a drink. So thank you very much. Thank you.